Hello everybody, this is C.J. Wiley with more Adventures on the Road. Down here in beautiful Florida. I was at a park earlier, uh, back in the, uh, I don't know if it's the Everglades <laughs> or whatever. I didn't see any uh, alligators, but it's beautiful around here, that's for sure. It's got a different look than it did up in North Carolina, that's for sure. I appreciate that that about all the states. They're all uh, unique. Arizona is one of my favorites. Sedona, Arizona. Of course, I'm from Missouri and live most of my life in Texas, but I've been all over the Midwest and uh, enjoyed it a lot. I played a lot of pool here in Florida when I was uh, like 20 and 21 and 22. That's when uh, big strong arm John and I came down here and, uh, and beat the whole state. <laughs> pretty severely. They still talk about that. There was a guy in Miami named uh, Air, Airplane Steve, is what they called him, I believe, or Airport Steve. Anyway, I saw him in Las Vegas, and he was still talking about uh, when we came through there and, and set everybody up. And uh, It was a work of art. Of course, I wasn't the mastermind behind that one. I was just the actor. Uh, Strong Arm John from Indiana. He's retired now, but he was one of the uh, all-time greatest pool hustlers and gamblers. He just liked to gamble. Bet high. He bet on anything. Arm wrestling, flip, flipping coins, throwing golf balls, shooting basketballs. It didn't matter. Anyway, I was thinking about, uh, you know, how I prepare for matches and, and how that kind of evolved for me through the years. When I was 21, I was in uh, Las Vegas at the MGM Grand, and I won the, uh, it was the Miller Lite, and Bud Light took it over. So it was the Bud Light World Series of Tavern Pool. There were 756 players, and I went through the whole tournament undefeated, playing eight ball on a bar table, which uh, eight ball is my best game. I grew up playing eight ball in rotation, 15 ball rotation, like the uh, Filipinos play. That's two of the purest forms of pool, and of course straight pool, but I didn't play straight pool until I was, uh, I guess, in my late 20s. I only played one straight pool tournament, and uh, I had to practice for two weeks. I started out, I couldn't even run a rack of it, and a friend of mine, Ben Tubbs, the tip doctor there in Dallas, gave me a couple straight pool books. I went home, did a crash course. Within a few days, I ran 134, and then I went to the tournament in uh, Portland, Maine, and uh, actually beat uh, Jimmy Rempe and uh, a guy named Efren Reyes, who came back and double-dipped me in the finals. So Efren beat me in the finals, my only straight pool tournament. But I was pretty happy with that. I just, uh, I like playing straight pool, like practicing, but uh, I, don't, I wouldn't want to play it competitively. Wade Crane told me one time, he says, you know what the hardest thing is about straight pool? I was like, no, Wade, what's that? He said, staying awake. <laughs> If you're a uh, straight pool enthusiast, I'm just joking. So uh, don't throw your phone. <laughs> Quit cussing me. Anyway, back to preparing for the matches. When I was in Las Vegas at that World Series of Tavern Pool, waiting for the finals, that's the first time that I ever really had my subconscious uh, kind of freaking out because of the pressure. Because we were going to play on video. Uh, back then it wasn't streaming video, it was just a video recorder. I used to have that tape. I think I've got it somewhere. I don't know where it's at. But I played, you know, virtually perfect in the finals. But before my match, the women were playing their finals. And sitting through that women's match seemed like an eternity. And I ended up having to go to the bathroom five times. I was like, how much water did I drink today? <laughs> it wasn't beer because uh, I didn't start drinking that until uh, I hooked up with Scotty Townsend later on. I've told that story after I won this uh, World Series of Tavern Pool. And uh, like I said, I was a nervous wreck. But going into the match, I was able to quiet myself. I had several techniques that I used back then. Uh, I studied the mind and uh, ended up... Uh, I got a degree in Ericksonian hypnosis, 
Ericksonian, uh, Milton Erickson, it's named after. He was a, uh, a very, very uh, intelligent man. He was in a wheelchair all of his life, and he became just a master communicator and was able to uh, elicit subconscious changes of behavior in people just by telling them stories. And uh, it's fascinating to study. Uh, there's a book, The Hypnotic Techniques of Dr. Milton Erickson. There's two condensed versions that I've read. And uh, I honestly just got through half of the second one. It was just so complicated or complex for me. I was only probably 23 when I read that. But a friend of mine uh, told me that it was taken, those two volumes were taken from four 600-page volumes of the uh, advanced uh, hypnotic techniques of Dr. Milton Erickson. That was written by uh, John Grinder and uh, Richard Bandler. And Richard Bandler was one of my main teachers in getting my degree in neurolinguistic programming. He is quite a man. He wrote a lot of books, uh, Frogs into Princes and uh, uh, Transformations. Dr. Uh, Richard Bandler was uh, yeah, quite a character. You might look into him sometime. I don't know if he's still alive or not. He lived about nine houses down from a natural health friend that I had in Plano, Texas, but I think he had houses in a few areas in the United States, including Florida, I think. I came down here to Orlando to uh, take some hypnosis courses from him in a convention center. That was just a weekend course, but well, I learned a lot, that's for sure. The structure of language, that's what NLP is, Neuro Linguistic Programming, the study of how words are used to program the mind. So as far as programming my mind to play pool, I have uh, talked about lowering expectations. That is the key to taking the pressure off yourself. I asked Johnny Archer when we were in uh, London at the Moscone Cup. I was the captain and he was the player. We were up late one night. And I said, Johnny, you were the player of the 90s, which is quite a feat. That was when Efren was playing his best, and Buddy Hall, Mike Sigal, Nick Carter, uh, Earl Strickland. Uh, I mean, there was just a, a whole slew of great legendary players. Uh, they were more intimidating than players today, in my opinion. Just, I don't know, maybe it's because of how they dressed or how they acted. or You know, I'd seen a lot of them on, on TV. And they become larger than life. I think that's a bigger deal than, uh, than just seeing people on YouTube videos. But it's similar. I personally loved playing on ESPN. That was one of my favorite things. But um, lowering your expectations. So I asked Johnny Archer, you know, what was your key in becoming the player of the 90s? And he said, I kept my expectations as low as possible, <clears throat> which... I agree entirely. <clears throat> I always thought the higher my expectations were, the more my ego got involved. Because if I don't have any expectations, for me, I really don't have any ego either. And that's one thing that I've, uh, an opponent that I've always had to uh, take you know, special care with, and that was myself, my ego. And uh, to become the player that I did, I had to keep my ego pretty much completely out of it. I always almost talked about how I played pool in the second person, like it plays, like a power higher than myself, which was true because my subconscious is what I utilize to go into the zone. And uh, Lowering your expectations is the first part of being able to do that. I actually would accept losing before I play. And uh, you may think that's like negative thinking, but it actually isn't. What I'm doing is I'm going through the motions that I already lost the match so that it takes the pressure off of me and automatically lowers my expectations. And, and how I figured out how to do this 
I kept getting in gambling matches where the guy would get ahead of me, like, you know, six to two, going to 10 or 11, or I'd get down eight to three. And I would just basically give up because I thought I'd already lost. But I don't mean giving up in like a way where I, you know, waved the white flag. When I gave up, it was more like I had nothing else to lose. Like I had my back up against the wall. And that's when I found I was the most dangerous. And you probably are too. I'm sure you've had situations where you get down and you just throw in the towel, give up kind of mentally. But again, not like you're not trying. It's just that you don't have any pressure. So you just want to, you know, go out in style and uh, maybe instead of playing safe, go ahead and shoot at your pocket, put a little pressure on your opponent. That's the one thing, you know, playing safe sometimes is smart, but it's hard to put real pressure on your opponent playing safe. I was always very aggressive, so I would uh, I would shoot at shots and play safe at the same time. That's called two-way shots or taking free shots. That's probably where I would uh, place the most knowledge in the game of pool is shooting a well-executed two-way shot where you're shooting a hard shot, playing safe if you miss it, and playing position on the next ball all at the same time. That requires uh, a real high-level understanding of the game. So lowering lowering expectations. I've also mentioned a uh, self-hypnotic technique uh, designed by Dr. Milton Erickson's wife who came up with this one, where you, uh, if you're sitting in the chair getting ready to play pool or or wherever you are, you know, try to get by yourself before a, uh, a match, And then how it works is you visually look at three different things. Like say I'm aware of the the red carpet and the blue ceilings and the green cloth on the pool tables. And so you list those three things that you see. Then three things that you hear. Like I hear the music, I hear the voices, I hear the pool balls clicking. Whatever you hear. It has to be your own, uh, you know, experience of, of what you're processing mentally. So three things that you see, three things that you hear, then three things that you feel. You may feel the seat under you or your right foot touching your right cheek or uh, your, your feet under you or the cue stick in your hand. Whatever three feelings you have. So three things that you see, three things that you hear, three things that you feel. Then go to two things that you see, two things that you hear, two things that you feel. Then one thing that you see, one thing that you hear, one thing that you feel. And uh, that will put you into a trance. It basically lowers uh, your brain waves from what's called beta down into alpha. <clears throat> and this is scientifically proven that the brain waves lower. Like when you're driving for 30 or 40 minutes and you don't remember anything about driving because you are in a trance. Even though at that, in that state, your reflexes are super good, your creativity is good, your visualization is good, uh, everything's kind of uh, fine-tuned except your conscious mind is preoccupied. Generally, you're, you know, memor- you know going into a memory in the past or you're visualizing something in the future. But generally, your imagination is, uh, is what you want to stimulate. The other way that I will put myself into a trance is through controlled breathing. And uh, you can use whatever number you want. Let's just take five. I would breathe in and count to five. One, two, three, four, five as I'm breathing in. Then I hold the breath for five. Same count. One, two, three, four, five. Breathe out. One, two, three, four, five, and keep doing that. And that will calm you and, uh, and preoccupy your mind. Again, you just want to lower your brain waves and, and go into a state of very small expectations. You know, I would recommend just staying in a curiosity state. Just stay curious. When your opponent is shooting... Watch the cue ball. Don't root against him. I would certainly never recommend 
watching his run out and trying to visualize how he's going to mess up. I've caught myself doing that before. That's not a good use of your mental horsepower. You want to stay positive, but you do want to stay connected to the cue ball. So when your opponent's shooting, just stay aware of the cue ball. Do your breathing. Uh, you know, anything else that, uh, you know, I've got other suggestions and other videos. The last three videos, I, I talked about some of the mental game and how to connect to every shot. And uh, this is just something that, that will apply to uh, doing the physical game, as I recommended and suggested. And now the mental game, you want to get into a, uh, into a zone. The uh, inner game of tennis or Zen in the Art of Archery, there's two books that are, are really good on that subject. So anyway, uh, that's what I'd recommend is, is uh, when you find yourself caring too much about a match coming up, you better do something uh, on the preventive scale. Because if you're, uh, if you want to win so bad that it's affecting your emotions before you play, that's not a good sign. So I would recommend doing the breathing, doing the uh, self-hypnotic, uh, you know, three things that you see, three things that you hear, three things that you feel. These, uh, these techniques do work. I've used them and many people have used uh, dark you know, Dr. Milton Erickson's wife. I wish I'd remember her name, but uh, you can look it up, Google it, and uh, it'll tell about the technique. I'm sure you can uh, see more about what he does uh, with therapeutic hypnosis. It's very useful, not only for yourself, but helping other people that you care about. Anyway, if you uh, like this video, please like it, share it, and uh, join my membership or subscribe, or, you know, just hang out with me on Facebook. <laughs> anyway, till next time, this is CJ Wiley, over and out.